Jay, dude, thanks for taking the time to chat, man. This is going to be, I've been looking forward to this conversation for, oh, man, how long has it been? Two months of planning to talk about, uh, I want to talk about Cult of the Lamb, but before we even get into it, let me know about this new update with Cult of the Lamb. And by the way, guys, the link is in the description. Thomas, Anthony, Andrew, Matthias Brush, it's an honor <laughs> to chat to you. Um, we've done this a couple of times and I always love it. It's always great. And um, as I say, every time it feels like we sort of came up together because we both had games uh, with the same publisher at the same time. So it always feels like, you know, talking to an old friend. Let's talk about Sins of the Flesh, which is this new update coming out um, the day that we're recording this, actually. It's coming yeah. out now. So this one's been really exciting because um, we, did, we did one update already, um, mm -hmm. but our updates tend to be like, just huge. So the last one we did was called Relic to the Old Faith and we doubled the length of the game. We added like 12 hours of content um, and kind of a lot of Holy people were sort of, you know, sort of saying like, shouldn't you be charging people for this? Um, yeah. And we just felt like, no, we wanted to we wanted to get it to people because we know, you know, it's, it's, you know, we're lucky to keep working on the game. A lot of the time, you know, if you have a game and it doesn't find an audience, you just have to like send it off. And it's like, yep. you know, it's like sending a, a kid out into the world, like, un, you know, without all the necessary, you know, things that it needs to survive. Whereas we're lucky that we can kind of keep making Cult of the Lamb closer and closer to what we imagined when we started it. So, right. um, so we've done that one and this is the second one. And again, we're just adding so much stuff. It's so cool. Um, and it's made quite a splash. Uh, we've been quite controversial with it, uh, with our media, our social media uh, team have been amazing. Um, and uh, really got people riled up. Turns out there's a lot of horny people on the internet, which uh, <laughs> news to me. I've been seeing your posts, dude, and it's like, <laughs> what is he doing? Um, but I think it's brilliant because it gets it. I, I'll be honest, man. I'm super duper jealous because when we're going to talk about this in this conversation, you guys have figured out virality, and that is an amazing achievement for any game developer because it's... it means you guys can just you've got eyes now and I don't see it ever ending. Um, as long as you don't make a major screw up and you, let's say you become AAA and just start making terrible games. Um, yeah. You've got a really like strong future, you know? <laughs> we got, um, we got an awesome, um, uh, social media and community, um, manager, um, who joined the team, uh, Josie and Lorna, and they're both just amazing. And, uh, Josie particularly has a very, um, like an evil sense of humor. And I think she right. enjoys um, kind of winding people up, but also is really good at, and I think this is key, is like knowing how far you can take it and then like going, okay, don't worry, it was a joke. Because we, um, yeah. we've caused all sorts of issues this year. We, um, we said we were going to delete the game uh, when Unity announced its uh, pricing that, change. Yeah. yeah, we upset a lot of people. <laughs> Um, and it turns out, um, you know, it was a joke. It was a joke. We're not deleting the game, but we were upset, you know, and it was like, and maybe we'll talk about this later, but you know, a lot of, a lot of developers would be really hurt by the changes they were proposing. So it was cool to yeah. be part of that conversation. Um, and yeah. it, it felt good to be able to kind of, you know, um, speak up for people. Um, but also kind of in our, in our way, which is to kind of be funny about it and, and, um, right. Yeah, so it's been really good. I mean, the key learning with Sins of the Flesh is that, yeah, again, sex sells. Um, news, news to everyone, shocking. Um, <laughs> but that's been, the, that's been the key. I think what's really core to what we've learned is definitely, you know, we're making the game, we're game designers, so we, we want fun core systems, but really you need to have some kind of hook that you're tying it all together on. So like at the moment, we're talking yeah. about our next, you know, the f what what update we're going to do next and we've got all these cool ideas but we're sort of like right but how do we how do we tie that together into a coherent package and that's really crucial and i think a lot of um indie game developers don't like that sort of thinking where it's like well it shouldn't be about the marketing it should be about the brilliant idea but it's like yeah it, it should be about both and they're both really important yeah. well i asked uh, i pulled my audience on twitter i said um would you rather make half a million dollars uh, every year for four years making a game you hate or would you rather just make a game you love with barely scratching by and the majority of game developers said I just want to scratch by and make something that I love Yeah. and I thought to myself I thought and I'm not saying there's a right answer here 
But if you want to be a full-time game developer and do what you and I are doing, you've got to be willing to suffer a little bit through, it's not that you sell out, you just have to figure out like, how, what, what's, like my, the suffering that I'm doing lately for our next game is I'm secretly polling my audience to figure out like, what's actually a good hook here for our next game? Yeah. And so it's, it's a painful process of like looking for the ideas that people really latch onto because the ideas that I think I'm gonna latch onto aren't necessarily the ideas mm. that are gonna sell and make us money because at the end of the day, when you're making decent money for your game, there's this sort of, as long as you don't treat it, as long as you're not addicted to money, there is a freedom that comes with that, you know? Mm. And you can, you can make anything you want um, and I, th I think that that all starts with a really, really great hook. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I, you know, your question, I've, I've done both now. Um, and I would say, um, the, it's, it, it's almost like that's not, that's almost like not exactly that. That's not the choice you make unless you're going into like, make some kind of like very of the moment mobile game kind of super casual thing where, you know, the, the goal is to make as much money as possible, you know? Um, it's not so much that I would say, you know, we definitely didn't sell out. We made something kind of edgy and that we really wanted to make, but it's yeah, more about, it's more about like, how do you present your ideas? So it's not like, it's not selling out because I, I don't feel that that's what Cold for Lamb is. I think it's like, it's a very, to, to me, it's a very cool game that I'm really proud that we've made, but it's more about, we were just kind of, we are conscious about how do you present those ideas in a way that like people can consume immediately. I kind of tell the story a lot about when we started the game, we, the core of the game was the, the loop. So it's like, you've got your base and then you go out and you dungeon crawl and you find resources to come back to build up your base so that you can go get upgrade your character and go further. And you know, that, that's the, that was the core, but the cult thing didn't come in till much, much later because we spent about nine months kind of arguing about what the game should be about. And we had, all these crazy ideas one of them was like you know you're a lost god on the back of a flying whale and we would go to conventions and talk to people like yeah we're working on this game you're this lost god and you and people's eyes would just like glaze over and they just be like mm -hmm. i don't but then we so we we knew it wasn't right we just kept going when we found like you start a cult it's like three three words four words four words and um and people would get it straight away and it's just that power of communication so it's Again, like it's not it's not like choosing to sell out at all. It's yeah. it's just like take your great idea, but you know, think about how you're communicating it, how you you know, how are you showing people and getting people interested. How are you getting people interested? Because again, like I've done both and it's a lot more fun when more people play your game. Let me tell let me tell you that straight up. <laughs> it's it's not fun when you've poured four years into a game and you the next day you've got to go right. I need to bring in the next deal because yeah. there's, there's no money. Um, you well, know, so. you, you, you told me this, um, I think it was a year and a half ago. You were helping me sort of do some ideation with Twisted Tower, which is our yeah. current game. And you helped me so much with that. And you formulated for me something that I, and a lot of my audience has heard me say this, but I call it the big butt principle. The and big, big the, buck. Bi the, the big butt, B -U -T. Oh, the big butt. Oh, okay. Not B-U-T-T. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. My mind is not as much in the gutter as yours. That's not, um, yeah. You'll get that. You'll get that. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, but it's called the Big Butt Principle, and you were sort of the impetus of this. Nice. Uh, the Big Butt Principle is blank, but it's it's for idea create idea ideation oh. for a game idea and a hook. So yeah. blank, but blank. Okay? So like for Hollow Knight, it's Metroidvania, but with bugs. Yeah. Right? Um, right yeah. with 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 uh with portal it's first person shooter but with portals mm. um with your game it's binding of isaac but, but. cult sim cult management <laughs> stodgy Valley right or, or, or rim you know yeah that's, yeah you know. exactly i mean that's so, how we, that's how we came up with it. it that it was like yeah yeah you know you know so much of it was like looking at what didn't work with our previous game and uh -huh. and saying and, and responding to what didn't work. And, you know, there'd be no Cult of the Lamb if we hadn't had our, our, our other games because we saw, you know, that 
you know people would see our previous games and think things like oh it's a kids game and write it off so we're like oh god we got to go we, and we saw hollow knight which came out at a similar time we're like we got to go darker and um things like single use content and it's like okay well you know you have 120 levels but once you played it once that's it and it's gone yep. and and that's yep. incredibly time consuming expensive to make and um and in the, like you know with streaming it's like you don't even need to play it yourself you can watch someone else play it and then you've consumed it you don't need to buy it so like yep. it's just so so you know looking at what are the things that um what are the games that aren't single use and and they were like colony sim farm sim games you know stardew valley rimworld and the other one that was big at the time was the roguelikes and you could play enter the gungeon over and over and over again and and you know the content just kept getting used and used and used and like okay so let's let's take yeah like your idea stardew valley but enter the gungeon and i think you're absolutely right it's like seeing what works and giving it a unique right. hook and and the other point about why i think that's such a good idea is that it's that level of newness but familiarity so you're saying like um it's it's this game but this and people are like oh i get that i know portal and, or, or like sorry i know first person shooters and right. i love puzzles okay it's a first person shooter puzzles i get it and yeah. that is like but when you're like you know oh it's a it's a game where we do this and this and that and i'm sorry i can't think of a good example off the top of my head but People, well, I think people, the, the idea, the, the original idea you had is a great example of that, yeah, where you're a right. god on the back of a whale. It's like, I'm it's hard to explain. Place. Yeah. You know, it's really hard to explain. And I, I you helped me so much because I, I uh, that that call we had a year and a half ago, because it, it, I realized that the shorter the description of your game, the more likely it is that it's going to be a good idea. Um, yeah, that's a good way to look it, at it, yeah. Because it, it's kind of like, it's like sales. It's like a salesman needs to be able to get his point across. He needs to knock on someone's door and be able to sell someone something in 15 seconds or they're out, you yeah. know? And the same is true with games. And, and, and it, you know, people might be hearing this and be thinking like the light bulb's going off and they're like, oh, it's that easy. No, it's not easy at all. Like to be <laughs> able to make a three word description of your game yeah. that is actually, uh, creates an itch in somebody is so difficult Dude, and right. you you did it uh our previous guest gavin who created choo choo charles yeah. spider train he actually beat you in terms of the shortness spider train like <laughs> it's right. like that's Two all words. you need love yep, it that's love all it. you need um yeah. and i i just think it's such a it's such a sad it's a sad piece of advice to say fo like uh, to obsessively focus on a hook it's sad because I think most game developers, they don't know how to, to obsessively focus on a hook because they mm. want so badly to see their product come to life. And so they yeah. start too early. And so I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned this, I think it was in our previous conversation. You said, I don't think I'm ever gonna make a game where I don't obsess about the hook first ever again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you remember saying that or do you believe that still? Um, um, yeah, I think, well, you know, j just to go back to the Choo Choo thing, I think like spider, Train, but spider, you know. So it, what your rule yeah, definitely yeah. holds holds true. I think Thomas um, the train, Thomas the tank engine, but he's but a spider. spider. Yeah, train, train, but yeah. spider. Um, yeah. And I think simple is hard. Simple is really hard because it's easy to get complicated. It's like, well, that's not quite working. Okay, throw on another system, and then let's over engineer <laughs> this until it gets to the, you know. But keeping something pure and 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 simple is is very hard and. Yeah, I think I think definitely um, I would I would not like I probably differentiate it in like if I had the time and an idea where I didn't have a hook, I might tinker with it and and kind of come up with something. But I would never push it forward as like a proper massive monster project. Uh, I would never take it to the other guys without either accepting that they'll make me turn it into like a clever hook or I've got mm, a clever hook yep. kind of thing. Cause I just think that that was the, I think there was like two really powerful things with Cult of Lamb and which, which led to a success uh, aside from just timing and, and amazing um, PR team and, and just the whole team being amazing. Well, all of that. you published with Devolver, which Devolver did an incredible job in, in yeah. marketing efforts, I assume. Yeah. That's like oh, yeah. their bread and butter. Um, oh, they're, they're so great. Um, so 
Well, can I ask you, you know, do you feel like your previous projects had a hook? But not, not to the same extent. No, definitely not. And it was never something that we thought about. I mean, we, so our two commercial games were The Adventure Powers and Never Give Up. Never Give Up was a sort of more of a sort of work for hire project where we, we collaborated with a publisher. The Adventure Pals was kind of our baby, and it was kind of the game that we kind of imagined, you know, the, the indie game dream. We're like, this is the game. We're throwing our hearts and souls into it for like three, four years. This is the one that's gonna, gonna take off. And of course it didn't, but you know, uh, we needed that to get to Cult of the Lamb, you know? So yeah. um, it, its hook was really like jimmied in at the end. And it was sort of like, you know, it was 2016. So the hook was really like lol random. You know, it was like, oh, lol random. Back then that was kind of still interesting now, yeah. not so much now, but it was kind of like, we would tell people this, we would, we learned like by going to convention after convention after convention, talking to thousands of people trying to pitch it, looking at their faces when we talked about it and seeing when they would smile. And so, you know, it's like, it's uh, you're a young boy with a magical giraffe in your backpack and you're on a quest to rescue your dad before he's turned into a hot dog. And you would kind of mm -hmm. see this sort of like smirk with the giraffe and then the hot dog thing. You'd sort of see the like, oh, smile kind of thing. So yeah. w there was definitely that, maybe that's where we learned it. I, I would probably wouldn't take so much of the credit. Julian, who's, um, so Julian, myself and Jim uh, founded Massive Monster and, and he, Julian was definitely the one who was like, marketing first is kind of drilled it into us. And I was like, I sort of came to them and I was like, hey, look at my cool loop, you know, the the, the base building and the dun and he's like, that's great, but it sucks because what's your loop? Like what's your what's your uh, what's your what's your hook? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I had the loop. Yeah. He he insisted on the hook. Um and then So we, the the adventure pals hook wasn't it wasn't a hook. It was it was silly, but it yeah, wasn't a hook. Silly as a hook, which isn't great i think um there was no like you know you had the giraffe in the backpack who would have cool abilities and things but it was you know it was just um not strong enough a player fantasy um mm -hmm. and then you've got the other the other aspect of it um where you promise the player so in the cult of the lamb okay you're 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 starting a cult and the player goes okay that means i can sacrifice people i can have rituals i can you know and for a long time, we knew we had to have those things in because that's what the expectation is. But, yeah. you know, there aren't a lot of games that do that. And so we didn't really have anything we kind of, you know, like if you're going to make a Metroidvania, you know what you're making, right? And then it's up to you to make a really, really good one. Um, but you know the format, right? You, you find your double jump here and then that allows you to go open up that area. And, you know, you know what the structure is. But for the majority of Cult of the Lamb, we didn't know what it was. We didn't know how it worked. Now yeah. we do, which is which is great. But at the time we didn't and we were figuring it out. So we knew we had these promises to the players that we had to fulfill, which was, right, how do we make a player want to sacrifice these followers? And, you know, such a core of the game is making people care about their followers. Um, that was absolutely, you know, it was almost like when the game got... Um, uh, marketed as a roguelike, I was almost surprised when that first happened because I'm mm, like, yeah. it's it's not about the roguelike. It's about the base and the it's about the followers. It's about it's, the yep. game is about the followers. That's what it's about, and it's about making you do increasingly evil things without you realizing it until you go, you know, oh my god, I'm a monster because you you've got the story <laughs> of the game, but you've got yeah. the meta story, which is the player becoming yeah. you know becoming evil essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, and so that that's kind of, you you have your hook, which helps you, but it also holds you to account where you have to provide you know, that. It's, it's crazy, Jay, that you bring that up because I was just sort of mentoring somebody today about YouTube because uh, he's interested in starting a YouTube channel. And, you know, I make games, but I also make YouTube content about mm -hmm. games. And I said, do you know what the two most important metrics in a YouTube video are? And he didn't know, so I said, it's click-through rate and retention. So click-through rate being your thumbnail, a.k.a. a really good hook, a really good title, really good hook, right? Yeah. Then the algorithm doesn't stop there. The algorithm goes, okay, they clicked, but are they going to watch? Mm. Right? How, how long are they going to watch? That's and that's good. retention. Yeah. And that's, that is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You can have a great hook, but if you don't fulfill the promises of the hook, 
you're going to get mostly negative reviews or, <laughs> or even mixed, you know. Sometimes I would prefer to get mostly negative over mixed um, just because at least there's some, some polarization going on there. But <laughs> the, the, the point is, is that I, I wouldn't even know where to begin with a, a creating a cult management sim um, mm. or, you know, it's, it's so, so, so difficult to fulfill that promise of that hook. Yeah. Um, my question to you is, is that, I mean, I kind of want to move this into the, the creation of the game, the, right. the technical aspects. Um, let, but let's start with that, fulfilling the promise of the hook. Mm. Was this a difficult, uh, let, well, yeah, let's talk about the, the design of it. So like the game design document and, and how you crafted this, because I think that was your primary job, right? Like the design of the thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like the mechanics um, and how it worked together. And then let's also talk about the technical side of the tools and, and how you created this thing. So, But let's start with the your, your part of the job here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it was very hard. It was very, very hard. And we didn't know for the longest time. And we knew we had to do it. It got to the point where we wrote a list of like, we went on these websites, like what makes a cult kind of thing. And we came up with a list and we went through it. Like, do we have this? Do we have indoctrination? Do we have like, um, you know, uh, b belief systems, do we have um, rituals, do we have, you know, um, e all of these things that we were like, had to like, tick off, and we had to make it meaningful in the loop of the game, which was really hard. So um, I think the sacrifice is quite a good example where we put it in quite early, because we knew we needed it, right. Um, and that's kind of why you have like, it's the sacrifice, like these tentacles, tentacles come out of nowhere because it was still early enough in the game to think oh yeah we might have like you know Cthulhu tentacles all over the place and we, we didn't really end up having that and really it would make more sense if like the one who waits came up and grabbed you know it but it that's just to kind of illustrate how early we put that in before we had any meaning to do it um and you would mm -hmm. lose a follower which was you know we wanted you to invest in the followers we we looked at the followers as crops in stardew so you we wanted you to maintain them you know that's why every day you yeah. can go up and um and interact with them and you know improve them and, and stuff you and then you get something back out of them so you know crops and start stardew was how we looked at, at the followers but so we, we yeah. didn't have anything and for a while it would give you gold but there comes a point in the game where you, you know you've got enough economy that you don't need gold and so the loss of a follower isn't isn't worth it and it mm. wasn't till like really the last minute that we thought actually what if it means you automatically level up your character and it and it was such like a, a like oh my god that's fantastic because yeah. i think jim came up with that actually and it just meant that suddenly you not only was it like a meaningful thing to do but you were directly doing it for your own personal benefit you were you know you were being very evil you were very um uh self uh what's the word you you you're doing it for your own self-interest, right? It's, you'll become extremely mm -hmm. self-interested and you're willing to, you know, hurt yeah. and kill your followers so that you can do better. And it just, it was fantastic when that when that went in. Um, so did you plan all this out in a GDD? Oh God, no. Or, no we, and the reason being- Tell me uh, about that. Cause yeah. I, you know, a lot of game developers right now are probably listening thinking, uh, you know, how, did, how what's his design process here? Because the professional quote unquote way to do things yeah. is to write all this out before you even start your game. Um, what, mm. what was your process like? I think, um, well, I, it would sum up in one word, um, iteration. It was just mm. brutal iteration and being brutal with each other. And So making stuff, you're making the game and then mm. you spend all this time and money making something and yeah. then you scrap it and then do something else. Exactly. We, we got to the <laughs> point where we were like A, A B testing systems. So we would just have a, a Boolean and we'd just say like, you know, is, are you, you know, another good example is this, the sermons, um, hooking them up to leveling up your character again came very late, which is crazy, right? Because um, the whole loop of the game is the followers make you better in the dungeon and the dungeon makes you better for the followers because you've got resources kind of thing. And we just didn't see that till, till right at the end. So we yeah. had like, for example, we, we just would have Booleans that, you know, uh, is it like, is the sermon mode player level up, true or false? Or uh, is hmm. it, you know, or are you getting gold or, you know, something, whatever. Yeah. And we would just get so into that process where we'd just be like, right, a, like rather than, we argued so much that we would just be like, 
rather than arguing, let's try both. <coughs> that's that's where we got to, where it was just like, okay, you got that idea, you got, I, d I yeah. don't have the time or energy to argue, put them both in <laughs> and let's try them. And we got to, we started saying, let the game tell us what it wants to be. And oh, that man. Yeah, yeah. So, it, so I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, like the, I'm just fascinated because are you opposed to a GDD? Like, what are your thoughts on a GDD? Because, like, I feel so guilty when I do what you're saying, and I do it all the time, which is it's 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 quote unquote wasteful. Um, it, you know, like the 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 fiscally responsible person in me, who is greedy with time. I want I I, I feel guilty because I'm like I should have been able to plan this better. I should have been able to plan this game design better. And then I sort of slap myself on the wrist and, and think I wasted my team's time. And what you're saying is, no, this is a necessary process of any great game to, to build it out as opposed to write it out. Um, yeah, I would say because we were doing something um, that we were doing a lot of things that we hadn't come across before. So again, going to that like Metroidvania, it's like, yeah, write it out. Fine. That's I don't. I'm not opposed to GDDs, but we were moving so fast that we didn't have time to write and maintain a GDD because there just wasn't right. So we had to write stuff for publishers to get funding and things. But from that point on, we would like I I do I do a lot of slideshows or I use a tool called Miro uh, where I'll like plan yeah. it all out and stuff and just. But then like yeah. that's what we're doing now this week. That's what we're doing, and then that's like scrapped and then next week it's like right this we're going to move this around and this is going to go here yeah. um so no i'm not against gdds um at all but they've just never they didn't work in this case because we just couldn't um we just didn't have a time or manpower or energy or need because we was we were such a small team as well and so kind of moving so yeah. quickly that you know ideas would be scrapped before people had even heard of them you know and yeah. it, it really well it was. reminds me of um it reminds me of like um like dietitians or like um weight training or you know you, everybody has the right way to do something mm. and for me like you know I've, I've met people and even for me personally i can do a specific diet because it's told i'm told this diet's gonna help you right um because for me like i have stomach pain and I don't really know why. So I've been trying different diets and I, I've been finding out that all of these solutions that you Google, they're right for specific people. Mm. But sometimes you have to figure out what works for you and for your body. And I think yeah. the same is true. I think the same is true with a game. Mm. Some teams function better, I think, with that collaborative sort of destructive I, I don't know what the, a better way to put it it's almost like just this messy destructive process of building and smashing and building and smashing yeah um and i'm that way like i i, I talked about it in one of my videos um like five months ago about how i felt so bad because i i kept changing things on my team um, yeah. i have a 3d artist and then a developer and i'm just constantly changing stuff and i feel guilty because i'm like you guys put so much work into this but we're gonna scrap it. We're gonna scrap this entire level. Uh, yeah. We're gonna scrap this entire mechanic. It's gone. We're just gonna delete the code. And they put they would put in weeks of work. Yeah. And it's encouraging to hear you say this because, in my in my core, I'm slowly learning that every time I create a GDD, it becomes irrelevant because <laughs> we're just we just move on without it. You know, we yeah. just leave the trains left the station. We it, it's just. We say goodbye to the GDD and we forget about it. it becomes this sort of document in a dustbin. Um, and so I'm encouraged to hear you say this yeah. because I think for my next game, I just want to sort of just feel it out, you know, as opposed to try and type it all out. Definitely. And you need that and you need to be responsive to what, how the game is feeling and, and coming together. I think the, the, maybe the caveat that I would, I think, and I think you're doing this as well and this is probably why your team is okay with you scrapping it is is you all know where you're going or what maybe you know where you want to end up so we had yeah, very yeah. very clear like three design pillars so the design pillars like it's quite a common thing where it's like 
um, you know, it's like the the combat, the cult, and the experience of something other. You you pick three like defining principles that become your pillars of the game, um, and the power of that is like every decision you then make going forward has to must reinforce one of yeah. those one or more of those pillars. And if it doesn't, even if it's a cool feature, you you've got to get rid of it because it it muddies the vision and the more we simplified again the more we simplified the um the game the better it got um mm. the more focused it became the more we could like you know hone the experience so i i would say yeah absolutely that that has to be the process and we have something at massive monster that drives uh producer crazy and it's called team sneaky boys and what it is is um it's similar to that thing about like you know there's no point arguing it let's just try them both and everyone will clearly see which one is better be then then there's no argument because like oh, well obviously this is better it's a similar thing where like for example the, the 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 way we have weddings in the game so one of the rituals is you can marry a follower or you can marry as many followers as you want it's your cult you know and rather than me try to convince the guys that this was a good idea I just put it in and I didn't even tell them about it. So they came across it when they were playing the game. And I love that. My feeling was like, look, if we talk about it, it's like, what's the morality here? Like, is this okay? What's this mean? What what about all the, you know, oh, I don't, and someone's going to go, oh, I don't think it's a good yeah. idea. I'm not, you know, but if it's like, well, it's done, it's in. Like, <laughs> what do you, do you want to take it out? Because we need like six yeah. rituals and that's one. So great. We can now do five. You know, it's like, it's like a fait accompli it's done so like it's more effort yeah. to get rid of it you know and that's Dude. um but that's, that's like brilliant that's <laughs> so we call it team sneaky boys and it's very uh stress inducing for everyone who isn't on team sneaky boys on team sneaky boys is really fun because we're just like <laughs> the game needs this and everyone knows it's right you know everyone knows the game does need this but there isn't time for it so it's like well we can do this yeah. in an afternoon if no one yeah. is watching us let's just get it you know and so it's so it's a force for good but it does drive the producers uh well uh, one producer Damn. that we have um insane and julian was producing during the development of the game yeah and he but now he no longer produced because we have a, a very talented producer called zia and but now julian has joined team sneaky boys so i you know we're slowly winning everyone over but the, the idea is yeah. like you're not you're not pushing out deadlines you're just like quickly getting something in that wasn't scoped but everyone knows that it makes the game better for example sins of the flesh we um we have a breeding mechanic in it with the followers so you you take them to the mating tent and you invite them to breed and it's consensual <laughs> they decide if they like each other or not based on a relationship status um and if yeah. they do then uh they come out holding an egg um and that's all i'll say about what happens in there it's uh, just yeah, for ratings cool. and stuff um, i love that and, that's so yeah. fun and i'm just yeah. thinking mechanically what what you can do with that yeah uh, that's really cool well we had um the egg would just hatch and you'd have like a fully grown follower but we realized you know right before the deadline it's weird we need there should be a sort of baby phase there should be you know children but or babies or whatever and so yeah. that was it that was a job for team sneaky boys there was no time for oh, it yeah. it wasn't scoped in but we knew we needed it and so we got it in and there are some interactions you can have with them uh you've got to sort of um you've got to sort of check in with them if you don't mm -hmm. and they're a bit neglected when they grow up they'll leave the cult um so you've got to make sure you're checking in with them and stuff um you know nothing bad can happen to them they're not part of rituals it's all you know but yeah um that we knew that had to had to go in um and so we just kind of snuck it in and again that's like you can't gdd that because um you, you don't know that you need it until you're playing the game yeah. you know this came yeah. out playing the game and going oh it's weird that we don't have this so i don't i don't see how in a very you know system complex game you can have a gdd that covers every eventuality yeah and you know this this really brings me to something i want to talk about which is the the, the benefits the benefits of working with a team versus working solo mm. um i think the majority of the listeners right now are aspiring solo developers um, and I was wondering if you could give me a few a few reasons why you love the opposite of solo okay. um, and I'm get, I'm getting there I used to be a solo developer uh, for pinstripe yeah. and then with never song I brought a developer on and then now I've got a much bigger team and it's so oh it's, uh, clearly it's more expensive 
but is it, I mean, it, it compresses time down. So, I mean, yeah. there's a whole conversation about there that is it actually more expensive, but mm. would you mind giving me some like some positives and maybe try, if you were to convince somebody, if they had some money to spend, why they should work with the team? Mm. Well, first of all, to all you, you know, developers watching, good luck. Um, it's, it's tough out there, but keep, keep going and um, yeah. you can do it. Um, and it's an amazing industry to be a part of. Um, mm. um, so, so being solo, so I started as a solo developer making like small little mini flash games and I would sort of collab with other people. So I kind of did both and I found that um, working with someone else, and this is not like hiring a team necessarily, I'm talking about like finding partners, which is very different. Um, you know, so you've got like people that share the vision with you um, versus like, you know, hiring, hiring a, starting a company yeah. and having, you know. And they have a company. revenue stake? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, people yeah. who, you know, this is like starting a band really, you know, you, you find people who do different things to you, but also, you know, are insanely talented. So what I did when I was making flash games with almost every game for the first sort of year or so, I would partner with someone different. And then out of all the people that I partnered with, um, Julian and Jim were the ones that stood out as like amazing. And so that's mm -hmm. why when we started Massive Monster, those were the two guys that I thought like I wanted to work with. For, and you know, that well, we were already, you know, we'd already started like the Adventure Pals and Jim and I were kind of already, um, you know, talking about, we were already like collaborating a lot, like quite frequently by that point. But yeah. finding people who, I kind of always thought like you you wake up and they've done this incredible artwork that just inspires you to, to be better at what you do um, is just amazing. And it's like, it's not like, you know, one plus one, it's like, you know, oh, well, one times one is still one, but like, it's like a multi, <laughs> it's a multiplier, right? Having yeah, people yeah. who are like better than you at stuff and coming up with right. amazing, you, what you, you never want to be the smartest person in the room you, you, because why are you in that room? You want to be surrounded people who, by people who are better than you and you think, wow, why am I in this room? How did I get, how did I manage to like wangle my way into this room? Yeah. That's and are you considered the team lead, Jay? I think all three of us would answer yes to like okay. ourselves being the team lead. Um, we're, we've, we found um, an amazing kind of like balance with the three of us where we all kind of have our own strengths and our own responsibilities. And, um, yeah. and we're kind of remarkably always on the same page with stuff. And if we're not, again, it's that thing of just like, well, if there's an argument, let's just try both and see what works kind of thing. And, yeah. and I think that was sort of forged in the fires of... Um, a very, very stressful development during a pandemic. Um, so the three of us are thankfully in a very good position in terms of the partnership. Um, but yeah, I yeah. think all three of us would, would say that we are the leaders. <laughs> so. Well, what, what about, so you've got, you've got, you know, skill, skill, you've got that in the bag. And, and you're set, like you said, it sort of exponentially increases the, the, the quality of the game because everybody's working off each other's energy. Yeah. What about, what about drama? And arguments, um, it, yeah. like you said, it's like a band, right? Well, every band breaks up, <laughs> yeah, because of drama, right? And True. and um, so so I'm curious, can you can you give give me some thoughts on any drama with the team and and yeah. how you guys manage that? Because you mentioned arguments, yeah. So what's really good about the three of us is we all live on different continents, and so we don't wow. interact with each other very often. Um, which is good because I think when we're all together, it's just this insane energy, insane party that just like wrecks us. Um, so if we're all <laughs> in the same room, I don't know how well that would that would work. Yeah, you'd have too much Honestly, fun. Have too much fun and, you know, being able to just have your own space. I think we all kind of like have our own space working on what we do and then trying to impress each other. Certainly a lot of Cult of the Lamb was me feeling like the game loop wasn't there, but the artwork was incredible. And mm. I kind of needed to hold up my my end of it, um, and, and you know, really feeling that pressure of like not wanting to let the others down. And I know, having spoken to um, Jim, that he felt the same with the artwork. He felt that you know so much of it was him trying to impress us with with the art and feeling that we were maybe being a bit harsh on him coming back and being like, "You've got to make it less cute. You've got to make it," you know. And there's a lot of that. So I mean, that's 
you know, such such a big part of it. And I think so. You guys critique each other. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, less now because we're our role now is changing more into directors of the company. But certainly during development, it was like yeah, brutal, like brutally honest with each mm -hmm. other. Um, no holding back because again we all knew that it was like for the best of the game well, all three of us wanted the same thing right we all it's not about like you've got to leave your ego at the door it's not about how clever your idea is it's like does this make the game better going back to those three pillars and the three of us knew we all like had this amazing opportunity with devolver we had this game loop that you know was familiar enough to be recognizable and understandable but new enough to be interesting you know we kind of knew we really really had to make this work and our previous games would flop so it was like we knew this had to be it all three of us were on the same page and all three of us would you know check in every day and go well this is not good this is a problem right. this and you know it got really depressing like really in the middle of it it was brutal um mm. You know, as I mean, it's video games at the end of the day. I have to get some perspective. But, you know, when it's your whole <laughs> it's, it's your whole world, I know, I know. you know, it was hard because you throw your heart and soul into something. You work so hard. And then the next day it's like, right, well, there was no there was never any like, oh, well done. You fix that. It was like, right. Next problem. Next problem. Yep. Next problem. Yeah. And um, that again, you all have to be fully committed to the mission um, to weather that storm. Um did you ever have situations where in the past where you've worked with a team where, where members weren't committed to the mission and you didn't really know how to handle it? Yeah. Um, we, so at one point in Massive Monster, we had a lot more people as part of it and we were much more of a sort of collective where there were much more games going on and different teams working on different games at different stages and it, the idea of the company was very different to what it is now um and that was really hard because you know when you are working with people and things aren't going the right way and you've all got different visions um mm -hmm. you know no matter how much you like everyone it, that's really not a good situation to be in so i, I would say maybe go go slow when you're finding your team if you rush into yeah. things and you're committed to to situations and people you know no matter how amazing they are and talented they are and they've all like doing amazing things and gone on to make amazing games um um it's it's like i again sorry going back to my story of the flash stuff it took like a year for me to like just work with people see what worked, see what didn't um and yeah. then you know landing on these these two guys that um it's it's not easy to find amazing people um or no let me say that again it's even when you find amazing people you might not have the right project or you might not be quite aligned so i think i've yeah. been very lucky with jim and julian in that we the three of us wanted to make this thing and we had a very clear vision once we finally settled on it so just, well speaking yeah. s sorry speaking of vision um one of the major concerns i think with solo developers, this used to be a major concern of mine before I decided, like when I was considering whether to build a team, my concern was, I'm not gonna get a cohesive vision here. Um, I can do it better myself. You know, I'll write the music and mm. I'll do the art and blah, blah, blah. And I didn't, I didn't believe that I could act as a director. And, and I was kind of scared of acting as a director um, of a video game. And I, that's what I do now is I mainly just direct. I spend most of my time just creating concepts and and putting together task lists on ClickUp where certain people are doing certain things. I, I spend a lot of time in the documentation. Um, I source music um, and sort of basically outline the vision of the game to each individual contractor that's working on the game. Mm. And I found it to be an incredibly cohesive game. Um, and so my question to you is, is that have you ever felt or what are some things that you do to ensure that the vision is cohesive? Do you guys just click? Or do you really have to work, like really over communicate with each other about the vision of the game? Because it sounds like there's nobody at the top, right? No director. So how do you, how do you ensure that cohesion exists? Well, we're very much like, I mean, there is, there's, uh, we're sort of like, you know, the three headed dog, you know, the Cerberus or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's, we, we know where we want to go with the company. I think we know what we want to do with the game. Now that the game's, it's, it's, it, I think there are like two answers. If you'd asked me this 
during the development of the game versus now like a year and a half afterwards you know we're, it's a very different company it's a very different state of the project where the game exists and everyone knows what it is and everyone understands the vision right so we've got like people we've got an amazing uh, writer jojo who like takes what we've done and you know elevates it and makes it more you know so, and we have amazing programmers harris and anthony who like take you know are able to kind of go and run with the things we might say oh we need some more traits for the followers and the next day harrison's kind of like oh look i've done these five traits and they're like wow those, <laughs> wow amazing so you know it's 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 trusting people finding the vision again like we everyone knows what the game is on the team so mm -hmm. we all know which direction we're going and then it's a case of like say like from my role would be <laughs> like right for this update the theme is about getting the dungeon better so like say relics mm -hmm. of the old faith that's what the idea was because that was the criticism we had was you know the the dungeon side of the game's not as deep as hades kind of thing and you're like well obviously it's right. not because we've got two sides of the game and they've just done one game so how you know but that aside you know i'm not bitter about it um <laughs> that was the kind of focus and it was and then we could sort of delegate and kind of from that stru overriding structure it's like well how can we hit that okay let's introduce this relic system and then like as you get more and more granular you can hand over more and more stuff and, and then people come to you with great ideas again again mentioning Harrison he came up with the photo mode by himself he just presented nice. it to us and I think we're really is he lucky. part of the sneaky boys oh yeah oh yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. definitely definitely he's like good because if he's not he's not allowed to do that right <laughs> right actually yeah he's sneaky boy with me with the photo yeah man. that's I right thought about that that's oh right. no you're gonna have to have words with him watch out harrison yeah um oh, yeah. so i don't know i i don't know if i'm answering your question but it's a case of like yeah being clear on the vision and then yeah you know for for example for this sins of the flesh we started out in a very different direction uh we thought it'd be fun to have like um like seasons and we thought like hey it'd be cool if you have a winter and you have a summer and blah blah, blah. you know um and it was just turning into and that everyone was on board with the vision and blah. and then we had to like we realized it was becoming too big and we had to kind of have a have a call with everyone and explain that despite the fact that you've just spent months working on all this stuff we're going to completely pivot and we're going to make it about wow. this instead and actually everyone was amazing everyone was like okay great that sounds i'm excited about this new idea and i and hopefully that's because everyone knew why we were doing it everyone knew that yeah. like we we all want what's best for the game which is what's best for the company which is what's best for everyone on the team because yeah. you know the game does well the company does well everyone does well and you know sharing the success kind of thing so um yeah hopefully that's that's what we're going for well and, you know I, I that's my my biggest fear before i started a team and i think a lot of listeners who are are, they're probably afraid right now to consider building a team. I think what they're afraid of is sort of <sighs> steering the ship into the ground or constantly making mistakes as a leader. Mm. Um, and that I think that causes a lot of people to just say, I'll just do it myself so that I can avoid the social pain of, you know, because you become really good friends. I, I'm super close with my team now. Like, I, the other day I was thinking about like, sometimes I keep tabs, especially when you're 30 years old, it's good to, it's good to be in your thirties. It's good to be like, okay, do I have friends? You know, cause you can get so caught up in work and mm. you can get so caught up with your kids. I know you have two kids. I've got three, uh, a third one on the way. Yeah. And so you, you get so caught up in family and so caught up in work that you go, okay, do I now, how are my friends? Do I have friends? And I listed out all my friends, so I do have friends, uh, just so everyone knows. <laughs> congratulations. But at the time, yeah, congratulations. It's not, it's not easy. But at the top of my list, the people that I immediately thought of were, was my team. Um, and so you don't want to let your friends down, you know? Mm. Uh, and so whenever you, whenever you spend, like you said, like a seasons mechanic, um, for us, it was like um, an entire chapter of our game that looked like... Uh, sort of designed like maybe the Teletubbies would design this entire hotel. And my, my 3D artist Felipe spent, I think it was a month on that. And I just one day decided, you know what? I don't wanna, I don't like it. You know, I, I, wanna, I wanna sort of scrap that and do something else. 
and I just felt so guilty. You know, it, it sort of racked my brain for weeks, just feeling guilty. Mm. Um, and so I just, I guess I'm trying to figure out, because you've been doing this longer than me with a team. I'm just trying to figure out, should I feel guilty about that? You know, like at ah, what point is it, at what, at, <laughs> at what point is it abusive to your team and their time when you're constantly making changes? You know? Yeah, I think there's definitely a balance there. I think what probably, I mean, I don't know, was 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 Felipe, Felipe pretty pissed off at you, or did he take no, that stride? No, or? no, he he's dude. He's that's the problem. Is he's so kind about everything that I can never fully know. Um, I don't think he would. I don't think he would ever be mad. Um, okay. And so you want to make sure that that's 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 the kind of team member you want. But it also means that you never really know as a leader if you're doing a good job okay. because my team is so cordial and kind to each other. Okay. And I'm thinking, man, you know, am I, am I being, am I taking advantage of people's time because I'm so flippant with okay. ideas? Well, Felipe, if you're listening, you gotta, you gotta start roughing up. You gotta, you gotta hold time to account <laughs> for this stuff because this is great. No, no, I mean, I, I assume he's not mad because he knows you've got a vision and he yeah. trusts the vision. Um, there's this amazing movie called uh, Touching the Void, and this guy basically is mountain climbing, gets cut loose from here because he's like sliding off. So they, the people he's climbing with have to cut him loose, and he, and he falls into this um, into this cave or whatever, and he wakes up, and it's just this nightmare, this situation. And he says, "I just had to choose left or right, and it didn't matter whether I was right or wrong. Yeah. I was making a decision, and that's what you have to keep doing." making decisions because really you know it's it's probably not you know the individual decisions probably not going to be life shatteringly changing you just got to keep moving and you have to yeah. give guidance and you have to feel everyone has to feel like well someone's steering this ship right it's it's yeah. you know i'm i'm doing my bit but someone's steering the ship and they're making those decisions because you know the the island is that way so we're we're moving that you know we're making this decision to cut that loose and turn that way a little bit um and i think it's just having that overarching you know and it, you know the overarching direction overarching vision and then everything comes down from there you know it's like you you yeah got a big big painting that you're making big watercolor you start with big plotches of color and then you fill in the details, right? So as long as you've mm -hmm. got your, you know, you know the sky is going to go there and the mountains are going to go there. Um, you know, the actual details don't matter so much and they can be filled in later as long as you've got that overall vision. Yeah. That's that's kind of what I what I what I think, um, and I think that's what people want and they're looking for. They want to enjoy okay. their job and they want to know that they're contributing to something that's moving in the right direction. Right. Well, let's 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 sort of, you know, finalize this thought process because you talk about vision a lot. Um, oh, do I? So in oh. in order, yeah, yeah. So in order to in order to make sure the team is 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 happy and everyone's working and 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 um, sort of multiplying each other's skills, it's good to have that vision. So I know you mentioned the three pillars. Yeah. So can you can you again clarify those three pillars? And it, those, those are correlated to your vision, right? Yeah, they, I guess they are. Okay. How would you sum up your vision in three bullet points? Like what are the, what's your yeah. vision for the game in, in three bullet points? I mean, what, like we could do it live now, like with um, Twisted yeah. Tower, what's, what's yeah. the three pillars? Yeah, so for me, that my pillars are, I sort of think of them as the hooks. So I, I have three hooks for the game. Okay. Um, so visually, it has to feel like Bioshock, without a doubt, but with a twist. So yeah. with like a Willy Wonka twist. So Bioshock, um, but Willy Wonka. There, there you go. There you go. That's number, number one. Yep. Yeah, number two, uh, mechanically, mechanically, um, it just needs to be, just solid Half-Life first-person shooter mechanics. I don't really think there needs to be any other twist there. The only twist is like sometimes you can move the tower and change the tower and change the halls. So it would be something like Half-Life Half -Life mechanics or, or Half-Life gunplay, but uh, you can change your environment, that kind of thing. You know? Okay. And then the third one would be the, uh, the story. And so the story needs to be... Um, uh, 
It would be something. Yeah, it would be it would be Willy Wonka meets Bioshock, so similar to the first one, but it has to be a tearjerker story at the end. So highly mm-hmm. focused on story, which is not necessarily the smartest, wisest decision for today's market. But that's what I wanted to do. That's my forte. So I said I'm going to focus on the story. So really, it's going to be it has to be a tearjerker story, um, despite it being crazy and violent and gross and weird and strange there needs to be an emotional through line okay um emotional so that's like the three line, vision that's points that. yeah. yeah emotional through because then you, you've got every decision you make every conversation you have with an npc can feed back into that you know can set yeah. up this tear joke that's right. moment and um yep. yeah every every weapon you put into the game has to reinforce the half-life combat uh weapon play thing and then every yeah every visual design you you know you're not going to put pirates in it because it doesn't fit your Willy Wonka um, aesthetic right so every single every single decision you make um, has to has to trickle back down to one of those um, right you know and if you come up with like oh but what if you go into space for a bit it's like no no cut that out make that another game Um, you've got to just stay focused um, on those three things. So and so the team will, it, as long as the team sees this sort of simplified three bulleted sentence, you feel like that's a great way to unify the team. Yeah, definitely, because everyone knows okay. where you're going, right? I think um, when they were making the God of War reboot, they famously hung the three pillars up, like in um, somewhere, like as you came into the building or something. It, mm-hmm. This is like a story, and it, so every di- single day you were just seeing that and reinforcing that. Um, everything comes back to these three three points, yeah. whatever, whatever they to, may be. Well, to add clarity to these three points, do they? And this is just helpful for 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 people listening because they might they might have trouble coming up with their three pillars. Are mm. they? Do they have a a category each one like mechanics, story, and visuals, or is it just anything? It's the way we do. It, it's just anything. I think like for us, it was like one of them was like player fantasy. We had to you know the feel like you had a cult kind of thing um god i can't remember off the top of my head at this point what our three are but there was a point where i could recite them yeah um but it yeah it was like yeah cult combat and player fantasy or something like that um gotcha or like yeah so it's it could be theme it could be i think maybe it's different for each game but it's um yeah it's just having those three points that you can go back to cool okay so let's let's um Speaking of speaking of leading a team, um, and 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 making great decisions for your team and picking a left or a right, let's shift gears to Unity versus Unreal. Okay. Um, okay. You guys, you guys were pretty outspoken on Twitter about the Unity debacle. Mm-hmm. Um, what what are your thoughts on on this whole situation with Unity? And then finally, what are you going to end up doing for your next game? If you don't mind me asking. And if you do mind, Jay, I, we can cut this. We can cut it. Yeah. So um, one thing about... So so the context is Unity uh, announced that they would be charging something like five cents for every install, um, which I think was um, a very short-sighted and very greedy... Uh, decision because I, th- I believe it was going to be retroactive as well so if you've already yeah. sold a bunch of games you suddenly owe them you know potentially millions of dollars depending on how successful your game is um i think they ended was, up saying that wasn't they, they ended up saying that yeah. wasn't going to be the yeah. problem is how do you measure that you know it's so it's such a convoluted mess and so th- at first I was like, Unity can't retroactively do stuff. And so they ended up taking that they back. They took that away, yeah. But then I realized, how are they supposed to measure that? They can't even measure it. They had their own, so, they said they had their own tools. Um, but then, I don't you know, want to trust them, you know? It's like, I don't want to <laughs> yeah. trust their algorithm. <laughs> they, they, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just this big, big mess. Um, they had to backtrack on a, a lot of it. I think they, they are still going to introduce pricing, but it's much lower. And their CEO has has since stepped down. Um, I well after we put out our tweet, Unity were very quick to reach out to us and say, "Hey, can we talk to you?" Um, so we, <laughs> what was your tweet, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, we said that 
what so the the changes were supposed to come in in january and so we so he said like buy cause lamb now because in january we're deleting it um because of unity's <laughs> changes and we we had people like crying Jeez, dude. And people took us seriously and i i totally understand but i i feel like it was um you know it was a joke that was said kind of through gritted teeth because we we were furious like we were all, like furious and you know even even if it's like doesn't affect us which it would have done and then when they said it wasn't retroactive it yeah. would wouldn't affect us so much um uh, we still thought about like you know all our friends who make games like this would absolutely s- destroy people and people who like were launching on uh, game pass and things like that that oh yeah that, <laughs> that one would, was tough they would make they would launch at a loss you know it in it's just crazy crazy yeah. um and so yeah so we we they were very quick to speak to us and we kind of let them know we, we we felt very very upset by these changes that they were being that were being proposed um and i'm sure they were completely understanding because they reached out to me too and they oh, were yeah. like they were almost embarrassed they yeah. were like well, i we don't know what's going on thomas we're yeah. sorry this wasn't our decision something happened please like basically just like forgive me but it's not really my fault because i don't know what happened <laughs> but, that, but that was also such a waste of time right because it's it's like well yeah. they're just putting out pr people to kind of calm people down and it's very yeah. they're like the person i spoke to is extremely charming very likable but it didn't change anything and it was kind of well, what, what are we even what are we doing here like what why are you like speak to someone meaningful or don't don't waste our time um yeah. and so you know fortunately they backpedaled the fee they are introducing a fee it's much much lower but it is still mm-hmm. you know a quite a change and i feel like if they'd introduced this first we would still be outraged but because we were so outraged um yeah. we kind of letting this slide um, i don't i don't know jay like i looked at their, their new pricing model is on the surface and well i should say currently it is better than unreal's um pricing yeah. model yeah however the the big question here is how long is this going to last you know are, are they going to pull the rug out from us yes. in a year yeah you know and that that makes me wonder like what are you guys going to do are you like cuz like dude my blood runs with unity like i understand it so well yeah and i open i opened up unreal and it's not Unreal's problem, it's my problem. It's like, they're, like the English language versus like Spanish. It's like, well, they're both great languages. You know, yeah. what, you just like one over the other because you were raised in it, you know? The same is true with Unreal. I was raised in that way of thinking. Yeah. And you know, you were a Flash guy, I was a Flash guy. Yeah. And so going from Flash to Unity, maybe you disagree, but like for me it was a smooth transition because they were, they were similar in a lot of ways. Um, Whereas I, ju- I opened up Unreal, dude, and I was so confused. <laughs> I didn't understand the paradigm. It, it was so bizarre. Yeah. Um, what about you? Have you checked it out? Or Godot? No, I haven't um, checked it out, but I've been seeing great things about Godot. Um, the thing is, we are such a sucker for, um, you know, bribery. And so quite soon <laughs> after we had this uh, falling out with Unity, they had the Unity Awards and they awarded us. Um, oh, there you go. So you yeah. have to use Unity now. So now we're, we're like locked in. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're going to stick with Unity for, for Cold of Lamb, of course. And then yeah. for the new game, we'll have to explore the different pricing models. Um, I, Yeah, like you, I've got, kind of got like no, like it would be a big, a big change to change, but we could yeah. um, and we would. Um, so, you know, I don't want to commit too much to one way or the other, but sure, you know, sure. this, this award definitely sweetened things a little bit with us. Yeah. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm obviously joking, but in, yeah, si- yeah. But, but seriously, um, yeah, I think it, it, the trust is gone, but the CEO went as well. And that know, guy yeah. was, um, you know, at EA, I believe, and was controversial for similar kind of, you know, money motivated yeah. reasons. Well, I told, so, uh, I told my audience, I, you know, I, I got to meet John and we got to hang out for a little bit and they, you know, they, it's kind of probably what they did with you, which is like, let's, let's sort of, let's sort of, uh, warm up to some of these developers, you know? And Mm. so they, they, I got to hang out with them and it was nice. They were nice. It was great. I appreciate it. Unity. Um, but, uh, yeah, I got a lot of flack for saying that, uh, you know, Joe's or John's a nice guy. 
because he was. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. But yeah. it doesn't change my opinion that that was a terrible decision and it was asinine. Yeah. Um, but it brings me to sort of this thought, which is, what is it about unity that works so well for you and your team? Is it just because you understand it, because you've used it for so long, or is there something about unity that you do, you genuinely do love? It's a very good question. Um, in some sense, you know, we, we moved from Flash, we went to Hacks, which is like a, uh, it doesn't have an IDE, so you're, you know, you're writing the game in like a text doc, um, and then you're compiling it to see if like, and then you have to move, you know, the the health bar 15 pixels to the right and then recompile it and check, you know, um, and that was so painful. We did that for two games. Um, and oh, so you did that for Adventure Pals, didn't you? Yeah, Adventure Pals and Never and, Give Up. So, oh, and then you had, I remember this dude, I remember talking to you about this. Yeah. I think we were at PAX in Boston. Yeah. And you said you, you were thinking about moving it to Unity. Yeah, so in the end, what we did was, again, don't be the smartest person in the room. We found um, a guy called Matt Tai who's, runs dude games now and he was far cleverer than i am and was able mm -hmm. to somehow create some kind of interface what? between hacks and unity and so we exported the hacks game to console through unity um i have no idea how he did it he's he's got he ported he ported uh pinstripe to yes. switch for us yes, thanks to you yeah. by the way oh did we you yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, introduced, yeah you introduced us so he's he's um, and done Cult of the Lamb as well. So we kind of, yeah. No way. Long term. Yeah, yeah. And never give up and stuff. So all our games. Um, wow. So, um, yeah. So it just seemed like the next, rather than having this insane, you know, hacks to Unity, let's just do it in, in Unity. So Cult of the Lamb was our first Unity project. Um, and so we've obviously learned a huge amount. There's so many things we did wrong at the beginning. So it just feels like we, we are using it. We are comfortable with it. Everyone on the team, you know, when you look for new team members or, or programmers, most of them are kind of got Unity on there. Um, yeah. We haven't looked. I mean, the other thing is um, we have such an amazing, you know, Jim Julian and now we have Carlos as well, amazing 2D artists. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, you know, we need to have 2D as like a core of what we do. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. Unreal is primarily 3D, right? But I don't know what the It is, yeah. The 2D is not there yet. It's, okay. It's, okay. It's, it, can, it can be. Yeah. Uh, like, like anything, you know, like, for example, Godot is an incredible engine. However, in my opinion, it's not there yet for porting to like Xbox and Switch and PlayStation, which is mm. a big deal, you know? Uh, so yes, I might get some flack when I say Godot isn't fully there yet because so many people are passionate about Godot, rightfully yeah. so. The same is true with Unreal. It's like, I, I just think every engine, it has it has pros and cons, and those pros and cons are uneven. So, like, Unreal is it is such a great engine for, for high-fidelity 3D games. Whereas, you're right, like, Unity, it's just, it's built, It I think it was originally maybe built for with 2D in mind. Um, I'm not so sure about that, but it feels like it. The, the 2D tools are really strong um, and intuitive, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's so core to us. Like, we, I think we are a 2D art studio, whether, whatever, you know, obviously Cold Flam is like a 3D world, but with 2D mm -hmm. sprites in it. Um, so we, we need, I think we'll continue to emphasize hand-drawn 2D sort of our assets because I think that's yeah. one of our biggest strengths. Cool. Well, dude, let's let's wrap this up here and, and let's have you give me one final sort of quick thought here. What's it like uh, reaching this sort of escape velocity where <laughs> escape velocity, you know, yeah, yeah, where it's like it's like you, you're not scrambling anymore, mm. you know, I don't yeah. think you are. No, 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 no. Um, you know, Tom, it's such a good question. And I've spent the last year and a half thinking about it quite deeply, quite seriously, because, you know, everyone goes into the indie game thinking mm. like you'd be lying if you said you didn't, you know, hope you'd find your golden ticket. Right. Like every everyone, you know, I, I watched the indie game, the movie and that like resonated so much with me. I love that vision of like you struggle really hard, but then you have this huge success and. 
And um, I think I was extremely naive to 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 sort of do that and pursue that. <laughs> I think we've been. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, we've we've managed to do it, which is incredible. You know. Yeah. Um, but there, it's just I've just you know a million thoughts going around my head. I'm trying to like give you a good answer, but it's it's overwhelming. It's have it's, you become a better person or a worse person? Oh, I don't think I could get much worse. I think I was already <laughs> I was already bottomed out. You don't get much worse yeah. than, than Jay Armstrong. Um, yeah. Well, I've, the reason I ask is because I found that when things go really really well for me, I become very. Uh, thoughtless about other people okay um i don't really i don't really think about what because i'm so comfortable you know like i've become very comfortable because things have gone really well for my youtube and for games and signing with publishers Mm. and so i get so comfortable that i start to forget what it was like before you Mm. know um and i forget how much of a grind it is and how much of a struggle it is for for people who who want to make games and they like, for example, they hate their job or they, they don't want to go to college and they're just in a bad situation. And so for me, I become, I can become jaded or, you know, Mm. um, just too comfortable, too comfortable. You know what I mean? I I, I, I don't know. I do hear you. I feel like what was quite good was I had a baby at the launch of the game. So no matter how successful we became, I was still just a fat dad in the middle of the night changing <laughs> nappies, like, and my wife would not let me have a big head. Um, there was no yeah. chance I was going to turn into this, like, you know, egotistical rock star game developer. As much as yeah. I had hoped I would, I think um, the first thing that we did was like sit down and say, right, how can we help our family members with like the money that we've yeah. made and stuff, and and we've done a lot of that sort of thing. I I think like uh, getting a bit emotional. Um, um the struggle got quite full on for a lot of years with um game development and um you know we're so lucky that we came out the other side and we've had the success but it could have easily not happened something could have gone wrong um there was definitely moments where the game was not clicking and um if we'd released you know three months four months earlier the game wouldn't have been what it is um so you know and i know um you know, Jim and Julian are doing a lot to think also about like, how can they help other developers, you know, yeah. be, be more successful in things. Um, I think like the, 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 the tough times were like quite tough, very tough. And especially like, you know, again, we had ch- kids. So like the, the, the pressure was really there. Like what was the hell are you doing? Financial pressure. Financial pressure. Like... like what the hell are you doing, Jay? You have children. Like what, what is this risk you're taking? Because yeah. the last two games, the last five years, have not worked out, and you've been really struggling. Um, yeah. And so, like this was really the last shot. Or we, we did you fun. ever feel like? Did you ever feel like you're you're just a kid living in a fantasy? Still, it's time to grow up and support your family. I was very worried about that. Like, have I? Because you set yourself on this road like ten years ago, and you have to keep walking that road that you set because it's like what else am i going to do like how how can i get out of this and there really was no exit like i couldn't see the only way was through there was no backup so um, oh wow so you dug yourself a hole kind of yeah i really felt that way and i think jim felt that way as well um yeah i think julian maybe a lot younger than us as well so i think he had and he'd had some other games that were a bit more successful but definitely i think he said to us he knew we needed a win like we needed a win for this one um yeah so i've um no so i think like it's still you know maybe in five years i'll be kind of like i'll have forgotten all of this maybe and forgotten the struggle and i'll just be like well why isn't anyone everyone like a successful developer like (laughs) you know um but it's still it's still raw like i still remember like you know two years ago like the fear um it got very very tight very scary and the game got delayed a few months which really was tough because the second baby was born in eight we were supposed to launch the game in March just beforehand but it got pushed to August so we had wow. this and I broke my foot and I was sleeping in this small room with the baby trying to work all night and um dude yeah it was uh it was a crazy old time so like yeah um I'm so glad so 
fucking yeah. fucking grateful if you've brought Cult of the Lamb thank you I love you um, and we're going to keep making this game as good as possible and we're going to keep pushing and, and making amazing things so um, yeah it's Sweet. it's just yeah it's sick so here well, we are congrats, this in the future yeah I know right um, dude so proud of you um, getting a little emotional here too because <laughs> we've just we I mean you we, we have totally different paths. You know, I haven't had a gangbusters game, but I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful for, for, for YouTube and, and what it's, what it's brought in for my family. Yeah, and it's amazing. It's so cool to see, but you know, I remember first meeting you at the hotel at, I think it was PAX in Boston. And it I was, yeah. I thought this, this, this guy is so freaking nice. Um, and I love his British accent <laughs> and I, I just loved you so much, and so I'm just so happy and so grateful that you've you found this success, and you really, really deserve it. So, and by the way, everybody listening, link is in the description for the update. Oh yeah, uh, it's it's free, right? Uh, free as update. long as they have a copy of the game, it's free update with the just god awful perverse update that you've created. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to get clicks, geez. Yeah, I know. Um, you really shocking. have sold out. It was sold out, man, and you know, it's great. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, dude, this was great. Thanks so much for your time, and that's that's it. That's it. Let's Cheers. do it again. Let's do it again soon. All right. Cheers, man. One hundred percent. Cheers. Get over here. Get down. <coughs> hey, thanks for watching. By the way, if you haven't downloaded that free two D game kit below. Click below, it's my treat to you. I used this game kit to make a game for PewDiePie in 14 days, and I actually got to play it with him in front of his audience, which is really cool. This game kit is totally free. It's my treat to you, and you can use it however you want. You can make a commercial game and make a million bucks off this game kit. I don't care. Or you could just use it for a hobby project. It's my treat to you. And by the way, if you haven't clicked like, that would mean a ton to me. Hit subscribe. And also, this is important, hit that notification bell. Here's why. If you get notified of when I'm live, you can watch me make my next game and let me know in the chat what you think about the game or any ideas you have. And you might just show up, your chat might just show up in the next video that I upload. All right, I'll talk to you later, bye. I love you too.